Hello, everybody, and welcome to Talk of Him. This is our first Friends episode with the rebrand yes. of Talk of Him. And we are so delighted to have with us in studio today, Terrell and Fiona Givens. So grateful to you, too, for being willing to spend some time with us. We've, so welcome. We've raised the bar from the beginning, right? Like, Yeah. Oh, well, we're delighted to be here, really. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. We, uh, a lot of what we've talked about this year in our discussions about the Old Testament, Gaina Lynn and I have felt challenged to sort of, out of necessity, reframe some of the stories of the Old Testament so that they uh, are more applicable, uh, mostly to our current condition. But we just love the things that you've published, both of you, in terms of uh, those reframes. But before we jump into uh, the nitty gritty there, we'd love to just get to know you for a minute, if that's okay and start with you, maybe Fiona, and just tell us a little bit about where you were raised and sort of your educational background and how you came to where you are today. Uh, I was born in Nairobi. Um, my two brothers were born in Dar es Salaam, so we spent the first 12 years of our lives in East Africa. And then we moved to England for a year. My dad got in uh, a job in the Seychelles Islands. I had such a bad childhood. <laughs> <laughs> We're all so feeling so sad sorry for you. <laughs> for myself. Well, I need to get a detail. Why, why Africa? What was, what, what happened? Oh, dad was working for okay. the British government, mm. okay. uh, East African railroads and harbors. Wow. So um, his major job was to ensure that the railroad tracks were rebuilt after the elephant crossings. Oh, wow. <laughs> so massive herds, hundreds of elephants. They actually did, mm. and they just walked straight. <laughs> anyway, I don't know that that's got anything to do with anything. <laughs> no, it's but, good. Yeah, it's a detail but, about your life. Um, my, my brothers and I went to boarding schools in England when my parents moved to the Seychelles, so we would fly home every holiday. And then um, I left school. I was going to be studying univers um, German at the University of Wales. And we always take a gap year, like a year between. Mm. I'm not sure that they do that, that much anymore. But I went to Germany, Frankfurt, and... Um, I, my, my, I, I met a beautiful woman who was LDS. She brought me to church one day. I walked over the threshold and thought, oh, what is that? It's mm. just a room on the second floor of a building. And um, she loved to talk about God, and I did. And sort of one thing led to another, and I was baptized. My family is still horrified. Really? Yeah, they very seldom talk what, about me in Were public. you raised with another faith? I, I was raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, my dad was Anglican, but he didn't attend church very much. But it, even for him, it was it was an unfortunate time. There was uh, the Water Army, which was a terrorist group, which is still active in Frankfurt at the time. And then there were the Moonies, and then there were the Mormons, and they just kind of all blended mm -hmm. together. Oh. So They were grouped into the people we avoid. Yes, mm -hmm. very, very weird people. <laughs> yes. So anyway, my to, to cut a long story short, my my family has never recovered. It's been how a very old painful, were you when you were baptized? Nineteen, so the worst. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody was doing weird, joining terrorist groups, or, <laughs> you know, running living in communes, money, living in communes, and I just mm -hmm. I fit that paradigm, and um, and over time they haven't seen no. Mm. Now, I don't think I changed much substantially. I think I'm pretty much the person I was mm. to begin with. So, you know, I, I love that you're sharing that because I feel in real time our audience members that have had a similar experience. Mm. It's not always spoken of yeah. mm. in public settings, right? It's a private journey that is yeah. painful and is true sacrifice for yeah. faith. Well, that's that's lovely to say. I, it, for me, it... it um, I see that faith develops over time and that, you know, even though my patriarchal blessings said my parents would join the church, there was never a time. Right. I just assumed it would be in this lifetime. Um, but, you know, now I'm older and hopefully a little wiser, I recognize that time is malleable. And um, so... And blessings come now or later, but they come, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank yes, you. I agree. Well, how did you meet uh, Terrell here. Well, that was really funny. Can I tell the story? <laughs> oh, I'm so glad I he, asked. He, li he likes the abbreviated version, <laughs> but I like the long version because it's terribly funny. I was working in the church office buildings for the um, presiding bishop, precarious supervisor, and the legal council after I joined the church. I spoke, or I speak French and German, so that was helpful. Anyway, I wanted to go back to university, but my testimony simply was not strong enough to withstand a university in England with all of the animus mm. towards mm. Uh, members of our church. So I just 
knew that I, I was just too fragile. So um, Brother Farnsworth suggested I apply to BYU. I applied to BYU and um, had to go to the consulate to get my papers in order. And they said my papers were totally out of order. And how on earth did I think that I could live in the United States for four years on this pittance? So that was it, you know, no visa. And wow. so I couldn't go to the United States unless, of course, I knew the president of the United States. He could overrule the embassy, but I didn't know him. <laughs> I thought you were was, about was, to... Was, was no, about no, to... I was like, no, we're getting I breaking news. No, I didn't know. And I, <laughs> Who was the president at the time? I, I don't know. Was it Jimmy Carter? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, the president. Um, and so I, I would hop between the German um, ward and the American servicemen's ward, which was, of course, all soldiers. And we had a... A family moved into the war just the week prior, and he happened to be the head of the international visa section at the American consulate. Of so it was course. one other person. Isn't that extraordinary? God is wow. like, so what was good. he doing there? And it was like, oh yes, Bishop, I can have her four-year multiple entry visa. I was a week. living in Germany in '73, and so I just really? had a moment there. I thought, if she says that will be lifetime, and we'll have to cut the camera because I'll have an ugly cry here. So. <laughs> We were living in Nuremberg. So. Oh, you were. What were you doing there? My father was in the military. Is that right? And my sister that passed by suicide was actually born there. Oh, And I didn't goodness. speak English when we came back to the States. I only spoke German. Oh, but I was gosh. the worst German student of all times. My German teacher was like, you really live there? Are you sure you live there? Because <laughs> I have rude. a version of German I speak, which is like, I'll just throw in... <laughs> A, an English word whenever I just don't know what I'm saying. So, well, I think that's a great idea. Of Germans course. do it all the time. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for voting. Yeah. God was so aware. So, you got over here. Yes, I got over here and I met Terrell the first day of class. So, uh, oh. you know, I was sitting on the front row exhibiting myself and <laughs> Terrell was being like this on the back row, you know, quiet and circumspect. Well, John and Sarah met, met their first <laughs> yeah, class. Yeah. So, oh, that's good. lovely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, ours was comparative literature. Of All course. Right. All right. <laughs> that should have been a, a prophetic statement about what was to come, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. We just thought we'd be poor. <laughs> Living in a trailer for the rest of We're our lives. Good books. We're uh, reading good books. Hey, for a growing family. Books. <laughs> but, That's Terrell, you had a totally different. A little bit different background. <laughs> <laughs> um, my dad was a school teacher. I come from Presbyterian and Methodist roots. Uh, preachers on both sides. Uh, moved from New York to Arizona when I was about six, and uh, my parents joined the church. Uh, it didn't take, uh, I think, would be one way to put that. We went for a few years and then, and then dropped out of attendance. And then one day when I was 16, my dad came home and announced that uh, we were going to move back to Virginia. We moved to and, Virginia. You uh, never lived there, well, right? I moved to, back east to oh, Virginia. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, so you you found a job in Virginia? No. Oh, we have family in Virginia? No. <laughs> Why are we going to Virginia? Because I'm the dad, and I said we're going to Virginia. So a couple mm. of weeks later, I find myself in a, in, a in, a, in a camper, a convoy, <laughs> with all seven kids and my parents oh, wow. pulling up to a campground. And the, the guy says to my dad, how long are you going to stay? And my dad said, till I find work. And uh, so like Lehi, I lived in a tent. <laughs> And uh, call it seven kids. With seven um, kids. Yeah, one and, of them uh, in nappies still. One in nappies. <gasps> oh, gosh. And we're living in this campground while my dad Were the teenagers work. sent back to get the stuff you forgot in Arizona? <laughs> no? Yeah, As your so mother wait. I wasn't, I wasn't the happiest teenager in the world uh, that <laughs> summer. Can't was imagine. that your teen years? Yeah, That's a hard yeah. So it was a tough yeah. time. But um, <laughs> didn't know anybody. And my dad thought, well, maybe we should check out the local church. And so we showed up at this tiny little branch in Central Virginia, where we doubled the primary overnight. Yeah, I bet. And uh, seven kids. And it took. That a was long it. Time. He was. My dad and was, he, and community. my mom, and uh, that's where I really discovered the gospel. Too, wow. I was a sixteen-year-old in Central Virginia. That's neat. And then, what got you to comparative literature class that day? Um, I went to BYU, went on a mission, came back. Where did you go on the mission? Uh, to Brazil. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I saw an advertisement for this major comparative literature. And uh, I thought, I love languages and I love literature. Hmm. That sounds fantastic. And so I showed up in Complet 301 and there was Fiona. Hmm. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> I, I love knowing some of the behind the scenes to get to this point where we get to have yeah. 
a conversation, spirit directed and doctrinally rich. Is that a good yeah. way to say it? Yeah. With the sure. givens, it is always those yeah. two yeah. aspects. Well, that's a great story. Uh, I, I'm sure we could just spend hours talking about just the. I know. I see books in right all of those it's stories. So I I'm like, can you write a whole book about <laughs> living in a tent? And, <laughs> all, but, and I want to hear about the 70s in Germany, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much uh, for those little intros there. I wish we could spend more time on there. Honestly, I do. Uh, but um, we want to talk about some some things today uh, that are relevant to some reframes that Gaina Lynn and I have focused on this year, but also very related to what you've written. So, uh, so the, for the, our audience who may not be familiar with the Givenses and all of their amazing publications, uh, for me, I think that we discovered through talking earlier, uh, my first book I read of yours must have been The God Who Weeps. And I was drawn to that just because of my experience with Moses 7, right? And that, that, was, a, that was a moving experience for me, uh, independent of the book. And when I heard of this book written a, oh, sort, of, sort of about that yeah. facet of God's character, mm -hmm. I was drawn to it. And then, of course, The Crucible of Doubt. And then uh, Christ Who Heals, help me out here. Oh, yeah, that, man, well done. The, the, <laughs> and then um, the one you wrote with um, Faith Matters, All Things, All Things New, mm -hmm. and then The Doors of Faith, mm -hmm. a recent compilation of uh, speeches. Four Talks are to give yep, BYU and BYU. And uh, then just most recently, Terrell, the one, did you have anything to do with this one that he and your son have written? No, I no? had nothing to do with it. I, I have no scientific <clears throat> brain. I found it difficult reading. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> So I mean, everybody else loves plug. it. It's just we may or may not edit that one when out. When it comes to maths and science. <laughs> no, that's beautiful. <laughs> and uh, tell us just a little bit about that one. Since I haven't started reading it yet, it's still on my nightstand. Yeah, it's a very different kind of thing. My son um, started that, then asked me to, to pitch it and help him bring it to fruition. But it's kind of Peter Enns meets um, uh, Daniel Kahneman. Um, Peter Enns, of course, has is, is written famously on the fact that we've lost the, the understanding that faith is about having faith, <laughs> not certainty. And mm. uh, then Data Kahneman was a Nobel Prize winning um, psychologist who has done a lot to help us understand the extent to which our beliefs are formed in subconscious ways, mm. that we are always predisposed in directions for reasons we don't always understand and aren't aware of. Yeah. And so what we were doing was trying to ask the question, what is what we have learned about cognitive psychology and belief formation and the sciences? Yeah. What does that have to do with the choice to believe? Yeah. And how does that reframe the challenge to have faith in, in, yeah. in this age? And so that's it's a synthesis of those two. So, so before we dive, yeah. how many children do you have and how many books between the two of you? Yeah, great uh, question. Well, we six children. We um, we married in the the Conky Kimball generation. We call it. <laughs> so I have lots to of children, replenish. and everybody will be happy ever after. <laughs> I feel check so, check. I feel so sorry for my children. <laughs> oh, it was rough. Um, <laughs> but um, I I love being a mum. But I wasn't very good at it. Oh, I, I I always say my husband is a much better mother than I am, for sure. Sure, you're way better than you're letting on. So I did several books with mostly with Oxford and other academic mm -hmm. presses, and uh, through the years. But then in 2012, <clears throat> we were invited by Sherry Dew to write mm -hmm. a book for Deseret. That was at the time of the. It was a, we started, of course, before 212, but it, it was at the time of the Romney mm -hmm. campaign, and Mormons were suddenly front page Google, news. Google and, search high. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so she said, can you write an introduction for a general public? Mm -hmm. And so we teamed up to write that book and thought that we were going to be addressing largely a national audience of people who aren't familiar with the, the faith. And what it, book? Uh, you're talking God, about? God Who Weeps. Oh, I thought you were talking Sorry. about, you know, your first one was um, By the Hand of Mormon. Yeah, yeah. But I thought you were going there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I read that one too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fan or anything. John, I actually am. I am. Okay. I, he is I a love super, 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 super fan. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually shaking. Okay. <laughs> you're doing so, so good. Um, <laughs> so we discovered, uh, to our surprise, that things that we had to say about the Restoration mm. uh, struck people as a, as a reframing of yeah. the familiar. And uh, so... Like gap filling or reframing, or both? I, both, I think, I, I, I mean, it's hard for me to say. Uh, we're the writers, not the audience. But I, I think part of it had to do with the fact um, that we're writing from outside the Utah corridor. 
Uh We are seeing our church and our tradition largely through the perspective of non-Latter-day Saints. And so we were used to presenting it uh, Mm -hmm. against the context of a tradition, of a Christian tradition, Mm -hmm. and uh, appreciating and emphasizing the novelties, Mm -hmm. the, the radical resonance of what we think were just some of the more wonderful mm-hmm. new insights and perspectives. Um, and, and we had the, the feeling, I think, together we shared that too often we see the restoration. I mean, if you think about what it means to restore a, a house. So you buy a Victorian house, you're going to restore it. What do you do? Well, you replace the mantelpiece and you replace some of the flooring. And, and that's not an adequate analogy to what mm-hmm. Joseph Smith is doing. Mm-hmm. Joseph Smith is effectively saying, right, the, the, the church went off the rails doctrinally. The creedal tradition is off the rails. We need to lay a new foundation. And we're going we're gonna to tell this master narrative that begins in an infinite pre-mortal past that expands into an unknown but exciting, adventuresome future. And therefore, as N.T. Wright says, if you change the story, mm. you change the meaning of every word in that story. Wow. And so, so we are still engaged in this project that we mm-hmm. find really, really exciting of asking, okay, well, we know what atonement means for a Protestant. But if mm. you throw out original sin right. and you talk about oh. theosis, mm. then suddenly what is Christ atonement. involved in doing mm. with right. us and for us? And we can ask the same question about, well, then what does repentance mean? What does sin mean? What does the fall mean? All the things that traditionally we've just assumed we all are assuming the same meaning, the same words. We inherit this And it's a cultural faith instead of really. And I love that you both have always approached it with the tenderness of faith promoting, but openness and invitation to maybe reframe it, as John said, in a new way. Well, I think part of it is, I don't think we ever feel like we're presenting this, you know, this body of knowledge that we have and we're sharing it, we feel it's more like we're engaged in this work of exploration and discovery yeah. and it's exciting to us. Mm-hmm. And so it's... Uh, yeah, and it's such a beautiful world um, in which we found ourselves. And it's uh, suddenly uh, we, we spent an awful lot of time with the early church fathers, so um, post-apostolic till about the 4th century, to Augustine, who pretty much threw everything that was mm. beautiful mm. out of the gospel. The idea of a pre-mortal life, the idea of beca- becoming like God, the mm. idea that um, earth life is an educative period, um, we're not being punished for a fall. In fact, the fall is an ascent right. because in Genesis mm. 3.22, God says they have become as one of us. You know, so it's, it was just really, really exciting. And, and, and so we both started to feel that this is a restoration church but it's not a restoration of the creedal fathers. It's a restoration of the fathers that preceded Augustine. It was a much more positive, beautiful, God's with us, he's got us, we're yeah. fine, it doesn't matter where we are. So, so in some ways really there was exciting. a perfect storm of circumstances that uh, allowed us, I think, to find an audience and to write this kind of work because um, Latter-day Saint scholars and historians of early Christianity um, had themselves been coming to a recognition that, you know, the story we tell of the apostasy and restoration is a little bit too simplified yeah. and uh, not quite as linear as we sometimes make it. And so there's a lot of work yet to be done, mm-hmm. I think, in recapturing what Joseph Smith referred to as holy, the voices of holy men and women mm-hmm. ye know not of. Yeah. So it turns out, and all historians of Christianity recognize this now, that there was no early Christianity. There were early Christianities. Mm. There was this multitude of different voices and traditions and directions um, before Augustine kind of right, pushes it into this yeah. one particular Orthodox strain. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is recapture mm-hmm. and yeah. celebrate these mm-hmm. familiar voices yeah. in the past mm-hmm. who, who got marginalized or dropped out of the tradition and yet who speak with a familiar spirit. Yeah. Would you, would you, I wonder how you feel about uh, something that I feel grateful for in terms of what President Nelson has said about the restoration just beginning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Doesn't, you know, I, that was so refreshing to me because like you, mm-hmm. I was raised in the fullness paradigm right. as though we had already arrived. Right. Like that's what we, when we say fullness, that means we already have it all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's just for, for better or for worse. I mean, that's, that's just maybe, I, I definitely was not a deep thinker growing up. <laughs> and so that's just, that was what I, th- that I thought. 
But um, I wonder how refreshing it has been for you to kind of hear this verbiage around restoration continuing and even just starting and greater things to come. I mean, how, how do you feel about all that? It has been enormously important uh, for us in our work as a kind of framing of what we're trying to do from right. a, you know, a, a prophetic utterance that validates in some ways what we're trying to do. Right. And also because I think it's helping to, to shift the Latter-day Saint paradigm. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, you know, we, we both often quote B.H. Roberts and mm -hmm. his, his remarks about dis disciples of the second sort. I don't know if you're familiar with that quotation, but he, but he says, you know, the seeds of the restoration were laid by Joseph Smith, but we're awaiting a generation of disciples of the second sort who will expand and develop and enrich and, and reframe. And so we feel like that's part of what this generation has been yeah. invited to do by President mm -hmm. Nelson's reminder that it's a process. Let's all participate in yeah. this process. Well, yeah. and I think that goes beautifully to our viewers and listeners that may not know what Fiona was referencing. I think God oh. who heals, you mm -hmm. really start out giving that foundational. Mm -hmm. Like if people want to deep dive into that, mm -hmm. I feel like that John's the expert of everything you've written. I'm an expert <laughs> of a few things. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, don't you think that that book is a, a really good starting point to hear more of these early Christianities mm -hmm. yeah. and the maybe nuanced complexities of mm -hmm. whatever the restoration has mm -hmm. maybe not been included in a Sunday school lesson over the years, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the complexities, I think, especially over last year's study of the Doctrine and Covenants, I, I said on this show, more often than not, Joseph had an experience that he was always hoping and inviting, as Terrell just spoke to, mm -hmm. for all of us to have. Yeah. Right. It was never meant to be the definitive end point. It was supposed right. to be the invitation to open mm -hmm. our yeah. own sacred grove experience yeah. and our own mm -hmm. visionary experiences of understanding and restoration and yet culturally sometimes we mm -hmm. we feel that shut down well it's so interesting i think i think that's such a beautiful point because um i've been reading the first vision and I've, of course i've read it so many times but this one time i was reading it i was caught by joseph's wording that he decided to um, try and have a conversation or something, an encounter with God, and that God might not upbraid him and he might venture. And mm -hmm. so you see what type of God he was expecting to right. show up. It was the Old right. Testament the Old God. Testament, yeah. Especially if you go to the, the 1830 dictionary. Right. right. Of what those words, words Yes, matter. yes, yes. And um, so um, upbraid means to excoriate, you mm -hmm. know, just to tear him apart. And to venture is to engage in a journey that very well may end in yeah, your death. Risky. <laughs> very risky yeah, journey. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, and so, uh, for me, that was, and that was quite recent, really. Mm. Um, mm. But then, you know, seeing this Joseph going in there and thinking, oh my goodness, I hope he doesn't. This, this might kill be the end. Me. I mean. This might be the end. <laughs> and then coming out yeah. with that. That new vision, right. that new understanding the of intimacy God. The intimacy and the and then, exactly. and we've lost and this because we love. canonized the 1838 version of that. Oh, they are. That's Instead sad. of 1832. And the 1832 account, right, he, he recounts how he comes mm. back. Mm. And, Different. And this feeling mm. of love mm. that just stays with him. That's and, what's transformed. And that might be a great just sort of yeah. study point for our audience. If you haven't spent a lot of time in, in the the various version. versions of the mm -hmm. uh, first vision, what a great study that is all kinds of insights to be gleaned. Yes, we... some people are disturbed. It's like, wait a minute, right. why are there? I it's know. Like, it's, well, you always tell a different You're story, right. emphasizing Absolutely. different details to a different audience Absolutely. at a different point in your life. But mm -hmm. I, I just need to pause and say, it's miraculous that John just said that. You just responded that way with just a few years ago, exactly what you were referencing. That was a stumbling block mm -hmm. for a lot of people, yeah. like they mm -hmm. had been tricked or that they didn't oh, know or yes. that that version yes. Yes. tells them a different God and mm -hmm. a different church mm -hmm. and a different prophet. And I just I just feel like it's miraculous that at the, at the time of this taping, whenever anyone's listening to this, mm -hmm. 2022, we just seamlessly had that conversation. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that's miraculous? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it's wonderful, miraculous and evidence of the ongoing restoration. Yeah. So I first started teaching multiple accounts of the first vision probably about a decade ago in my classrooms. He's always so, ahead of sort of just re sort of just regularly, mm -hmm. and it was very much like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, like Gaynelin said, nowadays 
So yeah. Like, oh, yeah, you know. But but it couldn't have come to nowadays without you. Yeah, yeah introducing without those conversations, into the class right. and, and and your students being in a safe place. Right. It's like okay, this is really just doing incredibly unpleasant things with my mind. Yeah. Um, but then having you there and and knowing your love and concern for them, yeah. and it was like just such a beautiful way to. Um, it's a safe place, a yeah, safe exactly, first exposure exactly. from a platform of faith exactly, and belief, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it's okay to have different stories. Yeah. Uh, all of our stories, all of our faith journeys yeah. are different in yeah. some ways, some learn the other, others. But what I love too is the, is the global movement. So you have people like Richard Rohr and N.T. Mm. Wright, and uh -huh. they're speaking the same language, and it's like, okay, this is a... Yes. A, a global movement, yes. and it's, it's it's just really really exciting. And and Terrell um, uh, had uh, had your research assist, assistance. This is just quite phenomenal. He said, you know, I'm just curious. You know, let's look through the past decade of general conference talks and mm. just look at the word heal and, and see sub a version of healing. And there's, how a, it's there's doing. a database you can actually access yeah. online, right, of general the general right. conference index, and it turns out it. that instances of the word heal in general conference have increased over five hundred percent in the last decade. See that 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 that's incredible. Maybe maybe we should maybe that's our that's our inlet for for a conversation here. Uh, to, you know, I think this is spread, sort of peppered throughout a lot of what you both have written, but um, if, if we see, what's, what's the difference? You know, we, we, you make the point of, instead of looking at us in a state of wickedness or inherently bad, we are in a state of woundedness. Mm -hmm. And if we're in a state of woundedness, then what we're in primary need of is healing, mm -hmm. not... Um, Excoriation. Yeah, exactly. And now so, suddenly all of those Old Testament references to Christ coming with healing in his wings. Right. You see Christ in the Old Testament. You see, yes. Right. You see Christ. Exactly. Yeah. Do you want to speak at all to sort of the most, what you see as the most profound doctrinal implications of uh, we are in a state of woundedness versus wickedness and what that specifically does to our perceptions and understanding of the role of Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice. Exactly. And I think I think what's so brilliant is that we're not the only ones thinking this. There are scholars who yeah. are looking at the Hebrew text and saying, wait a minute, Kippur, atonement, doesn't mean what we thought it was. Mm. It's not saving from sin. It's more like putting a dressing on a wound. A mm. And so, yeah, so we've a got... A bomb. Exactly. So we've got contemporary scholars saying, no, this is more about healing than it is of saving mm -hmm. us from, you know, our miserable, wretched lives. Yeah, the because, parable of the Good Samaritan is exactly, maybe indicative of that yeah, beautiful ex reality. Exactly. Yeah. And, and for me, I, I've, I've seen um, God the Father and Jesus on, on very diverse ends of a very wide spectrum. And, you know, you have, you have this idea of God, you know, can't, you can't wait to throw us all into hell and is really irritated with us all. But then we have the Son, who is kind and gentle. Right. Um, but that I think a lot of us miss that beautiful quotation. If you have seen me, you have seen the yeah. Father. Right. If you've known me, you've known the Father. So because, so now that they've sort of been adversarial, <laughs> two right. completely different. The Father and the Son. Exactly. And at it's odds like they, with each other. Yeah, and they just don't meet <laughs> anywhere. And so I think, you know, this new perspective um, with a vocabulary shift has been very helpful in my life at any rate. And I think... You ask about the doctrinal implications, and I and I think at least for us, as we understand the significance of these shifts, uh, it's not that we're saying we're not sinful, we're wounded. Right. What we're saying is there's there's the, the most important lesson in this regard. I think comes from Luke chapter seven, um, which, if you read against the context of the other gospel narratives, is really phenomenally remarkable. Because what happens in Luke chapter seven is 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 Christ is being ministered to by the woman with many sins. And right, and he says, well, she's loved much, so she's forgiven much. And then he turns to her, and he uses this expression in Greek, which is verbatim quoted by the other evangelists in other contexts. He says, so Sessa can say, he turns to her and he says, your faith has healed you. Yeah. But in the King James Version, only Luke is retranslated as, your faith has saved you. Yeah. But the Greek verb sodzo, and it's, it's been used consistently in this way, is no, he's talking about an act of healing. And so what he's doing, it seems to me in this regard, is saying that sin is a kind of woundedness mm. along with all of these other wounds that I heal. The blind man, the girl brought back from the dead, 
the paralytic. In all of those the cases, that same healed. verb is used. Yes, yes. You've been healed, you've been healed, yeah. you've been healed. Mm-hmm. And so what we think this does is it enriches and expands the scope mm-hmm. of Christ's healing, ministering work yeah. uh, among us. And then Fiona has, has emphasized so often the, the verses in Alma that talk about the atonement, mm-hmm. um, that Christ takes upon himself our pains, mm-hmm. our infirmities, right? Or, right? So again, it's an expanse, uh, expansion mm-hmm. of of that healing at oneing work. That he I was always disturbed by the verse in the Old Testament that said that God would punish the third and fourth generation of the sins of the fathers. And I thought, well, that's not very fair. I mean, I certainly wouldn't do that. I mean, I, I find that there's something mm. immoral about that. Mm. But then when you changed it around, and I, I was invited to write um, an article for Illinois Press um, and I wrote it on atonement and retributive justice, and I spent an incredible amount of time in trauma, in trauma literature. Mm. And, and that was so educational for me. It's like trauma is generational. I see it in my children. I recognize it coming from my mom to me. And, and that, suddenly that made sense. It's that this is a woundedness that continues generationally, and we are all wounded. That's mm. one thing that we share in humanity is this woundedness. So that makes so much more sense. That the sins of the fathers are really trauma unresolved. Trauma. Which mm-hmm. is exactly how we discussed on the show this mm-hmm. in the Old Testament and the story of Abraham and Isaac. Mm-hmm. It was not a vengeful God that was asking the hardest thing. He was asking Abraham to walk through a trauma that he had experienced mm-hmm. as a boy and come out differently from that. Mm-hmm. But how many of us are like, let's not look at that. Mm-hmm. Let's not see that. And I love this conversation around the woundedness because sin is, mm-hmm. creates distance, but so does trauma. Mm-hmm. I can't feel when you were talking the God, the Father versus the Savior, I know where I've struggled in my relationships mm-hmm. and why mm-hmm. and where the gaps in my own experience has added to the lens I see my Heavenly Father in my life, right? So you can see where... That's not quote unquote sin, but it's a wound that if it's not healed, it prevents me from that intimate connection and relationship with a loving father. It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, and I think about this this woundedness and trying to connect it to why would woundedness necessarily equal distance? Because as a father, when my child is wounded, Mm -hmm. the last thing I'm going to do is distance myself from that individual. And so I wonder if that perception of distance is more a byproduct of we've been taught that if I do this thing, right? And this is no doubt Satan, the great liar, who's introduced this thought into our minds that, oh, you did this. Why would he want to be with you now? No, I think, I think what you're saying is scripturally supported very, very specifically and concretely in 1 Nephi 13. Mm. This is this is the the verse yeah. that you and I go to so many times, yeah. where oh, right. where right the 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 angel is showing to Nephi the future state of the world and and the language is so, so mm. powerful. He says the world will be in a state of awful woundedness, mm. which we've just discussed. But he also gives the the reason right. He said because of the loss of the plain and precious things. Right. And so what he's saying is that theology impacts mental, emotional, spiritual health. Yeah. So Amen. these aren't two separate domains. If you, right. I mean, right, the largest affliction, as I understand, I'm not an expert on this, but, but my sense from talking to stake and mission presidents is that scrupulosity mm. is the single largest factor mm. in missionaries coming home early or coming home mentally mm. uh, damaged. And scrupulosity is about theological misunderstanding. Mm. Right. It, it's Absolutely. about not understanding the notion of worthiness mm. and love and non-transactional relationships with God. Right. And so that's where we, what, what we want to see happen is mm-hmm. increasingly we want to see restoration principles invoked as a resource I to hope. preclude mm-hmm. and heal yeah. uh, the kinds mm-hmm. of illnesses like scrupulosity that are based on misunderstanding. And I would just add to that depression and anxiety also, right? Absolutely. And yeah. if depression for in my own family and my own journey is anger towards inward, right? Mm-hmm. So if we have this chronic sense of shame Mm -hmm. versus where Christ comes and invites us to come out of shame into guilt, which is a signal of, I don't want this distance anymore. But if there's that chronic story of, Mm -hmm. I'm bad, Mm -hmm. I'm Mm -hmm. so sinful, I'm so broken, I'm so without hope, 
then how do you even approach the throne of God? Yeah. If you've already, as a natural man or a woman, mm-hmm. fallen right. so far, and then whether it's scrupulosity or depression, the lens you consistently approach mm-hmm. the throne mm-hmm. with it is already a really thick filter mm-hmm. that you're yes. crawling through, and right. you're praying to receive any kind of Mm -hmm. connection Mm -hmm. and your depression and anxiety becomes that wall. And I think one of the things I've appreciated so much of both of your writings and work is giving language. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I think counseling myself in truth with the sword sword of truth Mm -hmm. is having new words. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think John and I have said as preparing for today, You've given words for things that feel complex or, wait, I have a sense of this, but is there, is there a word or a way in which I can arrange these words so that it creates truth mm-hmm. and right. those plain and precious things come back mm-hmm. more fully when I'm in my closet, mm-hmm. when I'm on the mission, mm-hmm. when I'm struggling with a child in addiction or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those are, those are, I mean, uh, there's so many things. I, I could sit and talk. We should go to my house after this. We'll, we'll, turn, on, we'll, we'll turn on the will fire. Will there be food? There will be. Yes. Okay, we're coming. We'll order DoorDash. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I wonder if we could maybe think related to this. You referred earlier, Fiona, to life being an educative mm-hmm. process. Something we talked about earlier this year in an early episode was life as a classroom, not a test. If it's, if it's a test, and if we are going to salvage that term moving forward, it's a test uh, to the same degree my going to the gym is a test each mm-hmm. day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just to, to learn, grow, try to get stronger right. through failing, mm-hmm. ultimately, mm-hmm. right? And so in that regard, I can live with the word test, but most of the time when we use it culturally, it's a mm-hmm. sort of a pass-fail yeah. Final know. exam, yeah, not yeah. a pop quiz, right? Yes, exactly. of, but when you view, te- I'd, I'd love for you to share with us in the audience how things change most dramatically for you in your perceptions of God. And again, with the Savior and his role in this life, when you view it as a classroom educative process mm-hmm. with God being as Elder Uchtdorf recently uh, referred to him in a conference talk. I say recent, they all blend together. It's probably 10 oh. years ago or something. But <laughs> I do the same thing. He referred to him as a mentor. Yes. A mentor. And mm-hmm. I just love that mm-hmm. in in the context of life mm-hmm. as a classroom. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think it's very helpful that our theology um, begins with us as immortal beings. Mm. And I, I find it very intriguing that in um, Abraham 3, that the terms spirits, souls, and intelligences are used interchangeably. Mm. So it's this this idea that we've always been striving to be more loving. And and, and so when we we are approached by God, maybe we lived with him for eons, but it's like at some point we said we want to be able to love like you love. And um, and so so in our own um, theology, it is fabulous. And then you have this idea in the next life that is also a continual progression. And I think when you've got that mindset, it really helps you, or it's helped me think of things differently. So it's, it is educative. And I love um, Terrell, Terrell called God a tutor. Yeah. You know, always with you. Um, he'll yeah. stay after hours. If the <laughs> school is over and he's gentle and he's kind and he doesn't have something to whack your fingers with. <laughs> I, I think, too, that, um, you know, as Latter-day Saints in our culture, we tend to telescope time in ways that are really a little bit absurd almost. And what I mean by that is conceptually we understand we have an eternal past. Intelligence can't be created. It's eternal. Right. Conceptually we understand that at some point we think maybe we're going to become like God. Yeah. And yet... In actual practice, what that would mean is we have to be wise in all ways. We have to have experienced everything. We have to, as Joseph Smith said, we, our minds have to soar to the highest mm-hmm. heavens. They have to descend into the, the darkest depths. So what that means to me, and this is just a very personal application of this mm. notion of life as, as educative, there isn't anything that happens to you that is wasted. Mm, that's beautiful. I love it. Mm-hmm. Every experience, every sadness, every disappointment, every hurt, every infliction of injury, and every celebration of success, 
will feed into that curriculum yep. that we all. So it's in that sense, it's not trivial to say it's all good. Mm. Uh, it's all. It's we'll all good. You just us. quoted my brain. <laughs> <laughs> no experience is wasted. Yeah. Yes. That is that is a powerful concept. It is, yeah. It's exactly mm. what I talk about with stewardship all the time. Yes, mm. yes. It's everything. Galen's book on stewardship is amazing. Well, it's just that it's not good or it's not bad. If you see everything as stewardship, mm -hmm. eventually it leads to that love that you were speaking yeah. of, Fiona. And I, I thought as you were talking about the tutor reference, mm -hmm. anyone that, I have two kids in college right now, and anyone that's had that experience where they finally find the right tutor, mm -hmm. and there's this relief and hope, and things start to click and make mm -hmm. sense, and they don't feel so burdened down, mm -hmm. that, to me, ultimately, is one of the ways in which I know, am I, as John will say, synced with heaven and synced mm -hmm. with God? Like, do I feel that kind of precious hope that comes when I know you know what, God and I are like this mm -hmm. and we're going to do this thing and it's really tough for me, but he's already mastered it, but he thinks I'm doing great and we're mm -hmm. going to do it better together. Yeah. yeah. See, I think if we can link the ideas of God's love and the tutor, then something shifts. Uh, one of the be most beautiful things that Kierkegaard ever wrote as a philosopher, he said, if love ever ceases, then it wasn't love. Yeah. Awesome. And so if you imagine that God is the tutor with whom love never ceases, it's like, I'm going to do whatever it takes, yeah. but you're going to get this musical composition down. <laughs> you're going to learn how to play it. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I switch here just a little? As you were talking about, I think you say that in uh, Doors of Faith, that same quote about love ceases to be love. I could be wrong, but you've said it somewhere, and I've read it somewhere, mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and it brings up to mind the many families on the planet, mm -hmm. all of the families on the planet, that are having this kind of wrestle with, um, organized religion, mm -hmm. they've lost that feeling of, of love, mm -hmm. and faith feels um, ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And I really have appreciated that there's this body of work that you both can comment on or from, but I think on a personal application space, which this show always is trying to be aware of, where we can bridge what is said in scripture to what we're really experiencing, mm -hmm. When we have loved ones or our own journey of faith, where it doesn't feel like it's based in love, and maybe we culturally, I mean, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of some very dear people in my life that I pray they hear this, where they don't have a cultural experience mm -hmm. of what I think we have all tried to foster individually. And so they're burnout, mm -hmm. they feel the distance, maybe there's some mental health issues, other things, and they don't even see faith as a relationship worth fostering. Mm -hmm. I, I'd just love for both of you to comment on what what's coming to your heart and mind about why it's worth, the, as you say, the 95% of scientific evidence is based on what we don't even know, that faith is worth the wrestle for, and love is at the root of that. And yet, maybe that's not the cultural experience or the common yeah. experience mm -hmm. or the family trauma. And so they've walked away and they've mm -hmm. said, this doesn't work for me. The versions of history that I've read, the cultural stuff, the policy stuff, it's just all too heavy. Mm -hmm. What would you say or what have you said? Well, what I would say to those who have loved ones who have felt disaffected, or have given up. Um, I, we don't believe that any decision is ever final. Um, Elder Haight said in the last public address I ever heard him give, I was a father sitting in the audience and he looked out and he said, fathers, I plead with you, never, never, never shut the door of your hearts to your children. So I don't believe that God will ever shut the door of his heart to his children. Why would he? And uh, we love to quote in our firesides a, a comment that Elder Holland made. He said, it is impossible for you to travel further than the light of Christ's love reaches. And so I, th I think we have to have the patience uh, to endure and endure in love with those and trust that uh, God will find a way, as 
we don't quote a lot of things from Augustine, but Augustine did say on <laughs> one, one occasion that ultimately we will find God's love is irresistible. And, uh, and we think that's true. But if I can, can I just segue into a related question that we get asked a lot of times, it seems connected to this is, but if God is weeping, <laughs> then what, what does that foretell about our mm -hmm. Future yeah. despair. I don't want to spend eternity yeah. miserable. <laughs> Thank you for speaking to that because and, uh, that's, that's been on my mind for quite some time. And we think here the most important context for that is you know John 11, where Christ weeps at the, at the the death of Lazarus. But he knows. So he, but he knows. So he's weeping in solidarity, and in empathy. Mm. He's not sharing. He's weeping in hopelessness. Mm. And so if we can just imagine, as many of us have. I think about the first time your teenager went through a, a, a crush and then a breakup, right? Uh -huh. And they're a puddle of tears, right? We've experienced that. And the world is going to be like the world's this. Gonna, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as a parent, you can weep with that child. But you know. But you know mm -hmm. the ending. You know it's going to be okay. And I think, I think God's tears are What a are beautiful about, reframe. About yeah. yeah. Sometimes I just feel when I, when, I, when I think of this concept of the God who weeps slash the God who feels, right? Yeah. And I picture him mm -hmm. knowing all things in this moment right. that are happening on the earth. Yeah, that's lovely. Things that are horrifying that I don't even know about, but he is intimately mm -hmm. in it with those individuals. I just think to myself, I can't be God, right? Mm -hmm. I can understand how if given access in a particular moment to a particular person mm -hmm. suffering in pain, I can feel the hurt, I can feel the suffering, I can bear it with them. But, but I need to step out and go sit by the fire by myself. And, and I wonder if God has some cosmic fireplace he has to go sit by occasionally. Well, or... You know, that's such an interesting question. And I've been thinking, I have been thinking about it today. It's like, I think we have a tendency to really bring God closer to humanity than he is able to come. Mm. So um, I, 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 my feeling is that, okay, so we're assuming that God is going right. through this the same way we are. Right. And, and, and for me, Humanizing like, him a bit too much. A bit too much. That he's yeah. more boundary. That's what we see in Enoch, right? Yeah. Remember, there's that transformative moment when suddenly Enoch's heart swells right. wide. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's as if for a moment he is right. allowed to share that divine perspective. And that capacity that, and that, just, capacity that we just don't have in the But in we our, don't have yet. Mm, that's, and that's, then going that's back to, um, to what you said, you know, sometimes people need a time out. It's okay. I mean, God's we, not panicked. No, he is not panicked. Right. And I remember um, years ago, this young woman, and she was weeping, and she just said, it's so painful for me at church. And it's like, you know, perhaps you should just take some time away from the pain and let yourself heal. Keep hold of those things that are beautiful. Don't neglect your scripture study, but if you're finding church and the talks in church, they tend to be two triggers and you are overcome by it, then, you know, I, I know I've stepped back a little. It's like I sit on the back row. <laughs> you literally step back. Well, yeah, I sometimes I just have to, no, it's on the, it's where I can, wherever I can escape. But there are sometimes there are some <laughs> things that trigger and there is this whoosh of pain and I just need to run away. Mm -hmm. So I run down the hall and out the door, <laughs> <laughs> breathe deeply. And then come back. And then come back. Yeah. <laughs> but for some people, it takes longer to come back. Right. And I don't think God's on any time, you know, for him, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Um, I'm here mm -hmm. and we will work through it. And we'll do it on your time. That's I've always felt about, you know, the, the path is narrow and straight. and um, But I think we fail to see, well, it's narrow because we're the only ones on it mm. with God. And that's why there are so it's many ways. It's not a crowdsourcing. It's not a crowdsourcing. We're all walking our own faith mm. path wow. and we're all that's at different beautiful. stages that's along it it's not a broad one no, thing covers no, all no, kind it's, of, it's personal and intimate. i really it like that is. application thank yes, you that's it beautiful is. oh well, thank you yeah. and, I, and that's I, helped me and i think mm. that's an invitation to us as parents as grandparents mm -hmm. as teachers as ward members as neighbors as friends co-workers whatever to be that reflection of love in the meantime mm -hmm. 
so often in our panic that there's not enough That's time. Yes, yes, we yes, we yes. lay down the line and go, but there's no empty chairs cross stitched on the wall. And so what does this mean? <laughs> well, this is this is a really important point. Shout out this to the moment 80s people. in our history because a lot of people get so frustrated with different church policies that they think, well, my integrity demands that mm. I remove myself from such an institution. And I think, well, if your love is pure, then you want to be the person there on the pew mm -hmm. to greet and comfort and support that individual that you think is being marginalized in the church. That's beautiful. Well, and, and for me, I, I, I just find so much power in the baptismal covenants. I, th I think yeah. that is the covenant. Agreed. Um, but you, th this idea, and I, I've worked with it for a while, but um, th we, I, I feel that we are being, through our baptismal covenants, we are being asked to co heal, mm. that we are given, you know, please help me. Now, there are millions of people all over the world who are living those, you know, mourn with those who mourn, comfort those who stand in comfort, mm. who need to come carry each other's burdens. We see that going everywhere. But for me, those covenants are a particular call. Um, it's like, Fiona, you, you need to be, think, make sure that you are. In anxiously, anxiously engaged in these things, and then it was it was it was after the book was published that I I realized that each member of the Godhead is represented and may be present when we make those covenants. Mm. So the God who weeps, God the Father, the God who carries our burdens all the way through His life into Gethsemane and to Golgotha, God the Christ, and then the God who comforts, God the Holy Spirit. So. The entire Godhead is there. And I just awesome. I just moved out of this feeling of being acted upon to know you are invited. In mm -hmm. our faith tradition, you make covenants to help Christ heal. And for me, that's been the most liberating, mm -hmm. most transforming, and most empowering um, thing in my life. No, the power is in you, it says in the Doctrine and Covenants, Yes, right? exactly, so, exactly, so go, go do it. exactly. Yeah. And it's divine power. Yes, Savior. Yes, exactly, Zion, right? exactly. And the mothers of Israel, I mean, I think of the stripling warrior mothers and the mothers of Israel and these covenant-keeping women mm -hmm. that were able to send their children mm -hmm. out into literal right. battle while they held their covenants, that mm -hmm. power extend. Mm -hmm. extends to yes, our children, right? Yes, and so, so beautiful. often, I think to add to what you were saying to those that are like, I've got to walk away because this is the line and the policy mm -hmm. has just violated this final value mm -hmm. of mine. I think so often that when we keep our covenants, that extends like a tent mm -hmm. in Zion, right? Those yeah. stakes become strong covering for however long that journey mm -hmm. takes. And it doesn't always feel easy. It does feel sometimes, yeah. like you said, to go to the back row and wonder, mm -hmm. you know, who's going to sit back here with me? But look around. There's there's likely oh, yes. about 10 others yes. that are squirming oh, in their absolutely. seat, and they're not sure how absolutely. the story is going to play out and if they yeah. can keep keeping their covenants. Well, it was it was so interesting. We, had a, we have a friend, and um, she was in a, a very conservative ward in Salt Lake, um, where the testimonies were redolent with, I know, I know, I know, they're really certain. Um, and then her bishop asked her if she um, would bear her testimony that day, and she didn't have her family with her. But when she, bought, when she bore her testimony, it was, I don't know. I don't know, but I have experienced. And, um, and then she was so worried about how the congregation would react that she mm. fled as soon as she bore her testimony. Mm -hmm. During that week, she received emails, text yeah. messages, phone calls from so many people in the ward saying, thank you. Mm -hmm. She'd made herself vulnerable mm -hmm. and they responded to that vulnerability. They rose to that vulnerability. And it's, you know, essentially saying, I don't really understand what you said, but I feel your pain and I just want to say thank you mm -hmm. for speaking your truth. The authenticity of yes, her testimony. Yes, yes, yes. And it just really, really stirred um, the members in that ward and and they responded to her vulnerability by coming out to try and mm. say we we are we don't really understand but we're here for yeah. you mm. well uh maybe that's a great conversation we can have when you guys come back next time <laughs> uh, that's something you referred to earlier terrell about um 
you know, belief, you know, we, we come from the, the tradition of certainty, mm -hmm. right? And, and for me, most of our claims to certainty are illusions in, in that, you know, Alma 32 seems to indicate that the yeah. only thing we can know for certain are the things we've experienced mm -hmm. through our experimentation, which provide the yeah. evidence and assurance mm -hmm. that strengthens the belief, but we yes. never come to that perfect knowledge quite yet, right? right? right. But I know what I experienced. Yes. And that's why I'm drawing this conclusion. And if you can come up with a better conclusion mm -hmm. to draw based on what I experienced, please offer it mm -hmm. and I'll consider it. Yeah. But these, I'm, I'm where I'm at today mm -hmm. based on experiences yeah. I have had yeah. that are ineffable. Yeah. And, um, well, I think in large part that's where the God Who Weeps came out. I've had these crushes, one on Bruce Willis and one on Christian Bale. <laughs> he has, he's monogamous. He's only been in love with Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> From the Christian. moment he saw her turn this a lady. This is the greatest <laughs> conversation of my life. Did you just hear Bruce Willis and Michelle Pfeiffer yeah. from the given? Okay. That is awesome. Thank you. Anyway, so I watch all of Bruce Willis's films, and I watch this one, and I just don't anybody ever watch this film. And it was about African genocide, and I remember just turning off the television and, you know, just raising my voice slightly at God and telling him, you know, I don't want to be a God because I don't want to right. experience this right. on a, a personal, familial, societal right. globe. I know you see something, you're seeing somebody about it. And I have a few, you know, really good Are names. You seeing <laughs> I love you so much. Are you, you know, seeing someone about that? <laughs> yes. Anyway, so, you know, I, it took me a while to calm down. You know, I, I could just see God waiting. It's okay, she'll calm down. Maybe not yet. I'm sure she'll calm down. And so once I'd calmed down, I went through my little pantheon of deities, this very little, and I found I kept chucking them out, no, 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 no. And then I came to our God, and it was like, okay, so this God is the only God I know who has suffered for us. And it's like, okay, that's a magnificent God. Let me look at that more closely. And it was at that moment that I felt prompted to open um, Moses 7 again. And they say, but, oh, actually, the myth has been mythed. Um, <laughs> apparently, Michelangelo did not see the, 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 the sculptures coming out of the marble. But I swear, I experienced God emerging from that text. Uh -huh. And it just changed my world. Uh -huh. And it was like we worship a God who is deserving of adoration and veneration because he's in this with us. Uh -huh. He's not out there, right. you know. He's not having an arm's distance relationship with exactly. us. Exactly. He's in it with us. Yeah. It was, uh, uh, anyway, that just talking about experiences. So many wonderful talking points for the Givens' is part two <laughs> later this did you year. Want, did you want to add something, Donna? <laughs> can, I, can I end with one? Yeah, I know we're, yeah, yeah, I knew yeah. we were going to break our own timestamp promise. <laughs> I don't care at this point. <laughs> Maybe the Givenses do, but okay. we don't. Okay. Be clear. I, I would just, unless, John, you have anything else no, no, or please. anything on your heart, but I hope this no. question allows for that yeah. to come out. And that is, I think what we've discussed today has been so, it's changed my conversion process. And I really believe that's what we're always working on. I tell my kids all the time, do not stand up and say, I know, stand up every day and know what you're working mm -hmm. on. What are you individually doing to personally keep yourself on that conversion path? And it doesn't have to be a huge, you know, I think sometimes we think it needs to be this unique thing that no one has thought of doing. It may be the basic primary things that we always repeat, but I always love asking that because what I've learned from my friends when they share their holy habits mm -hmm. or their conversion process, it just moves the needle in my own mm -hmm. Practices. Yeah, so, whoever would like to. Okay, um, two things that I guess I would point to. <clears throat> one is um, I'll try to quickly tell this story of George Steiner, one of the greatest intellectuals of our century. He came to my graduate group and and uh, told us the story of a Russian woman who had been imprisoned in the gulag, and uh, was asked, "How did you survive all of those years?" And she said, "Well, I was a literature teacher, and I had." this repertoire of great and beautiful poetry. And I spent my days and years translating it into other languages in my mind. Wow. And then he asked us this question. He said, how is the temple of your mind furnished? Mm -hmm. Wow. 
And uh, so I think it was probably that day or soon thereafter I went home and I, I, I've printed off over 100 three by five cards with my favorite scriptures, my favorite poems. And uh, I try to memorize those because I want my mind to be furnished with yeah. that kind of furniture. So that's, that's one process I'm continually engaged in. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing, Fiona and I both have this, it's kind of a joint project. I don't know that it has concrete form yet, but we both feel profoundly um, uh, appreciative of and loving of the, the invisible church, as we call it, those many, okay. many inspired holy men and women of the past. And so we make it a habit to build a library and read frequently from this library of what we think are some of the most inspired voices of the past. And they have become scripture to us in the sense mm -hmm. that we believe what they spoke was oftentimes moved by the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. So Julian of Norwich and George mm -hmm. MacDonald and Thomas Traherne and, and dozens of others. It's, it's interesting. I, I find it interesting that I have never felt the love of God, never felt it until I read Julian of Norwich's showings. And every sentence is stamped with God loves you absolutely. By the time I had finished that book, I was feeling God's love for mm. me. Wow. And so we really do. There are, there, there are voices everywhere in so many different traditions. It's um, acting on present. articles of faith of looking for that truth, yeah, right? Yeah, yes. So, um, so, you know, pretty much ditto to whatever. You don't want to add any extra Fiona magic to Oh, that. yeah, Fiona magic. Any, any movies you recommend? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see. Um, mm, yeah, probably a few, but I can't, they don't come to mind right now. I'm, I'm very dark in my movie taste. But no, really, I, I think Terrell and I have experienced, and we do experience the very same way um, in literature, um, in the voices of the past, um, in the voices of the present. Uh, somebody has suggested, you know, I read Richard Raw's Meditations, and he has beautiful things to say. The Daily Meditations yep. subscriber it's, right You're here. speaking John's language. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it's, and, and also, you know, I do believe in a global Zion. And I do believe that when Christ comes, it will be a global community greeting him. Um, I remember I was... All, I had seen every knee shall bow and every tongue confess as a liege lord self relationship. Mm. And then after our conversion to this beautiful God, it's like, no, God is not king. He does not claim that title. He doesn't behave that way. And he doesn't want to be known as king. And then we're just lesser, but we need to keep, you know, falling on our knees before him. And then it occurred to me that everybody will be there kneeling. And they will be saying, oh, I, I knew you as Allah, or I knew you as Buddha, and, now, and you are now Christ. And that, you know, just shows we were doing the whole, you know, world was trying to yeah. um, help <laughs> humankind, help their families. And the acknowledgement is, he is the healer of the world. And that's why we are all kneeling before him, is mm. not worship in the serf liege lord right. relationship, but as Adoration. you are the Christ. Adoration. Adoration, you are the Christ. And you communion the together, right? That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's Anything beautiful. else, brother? No, I think that's a perfect, <laughs> perfect. place to end. Yes. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us today and for sharing. Thank you so much for sauce. inviting us. This, this has been really beautiful. The sacredness in the studio, I always pray that our viewers experience it. Mm -hmm. And John and I hear from them every day mm -hmm. that it gets through the camera, through the podcast, mm -hmm. that they can feel the sacredness. And I have felt it today. It has felt like a, a holy conversation mm -hmm. with um, two individuals that I, we could spend hours learning with you and from you. But thank you for your generosity. Oh, you are so you. kind. And your life experiences that have brought you, your stewardships that have brought you to this point so that I'm grateful we're on the planet with you is what I want to say. <laughs> oh, so I could be on the planet at any time. And I just, I'm really grateful that God was like, you need to be on the planet when the givens are there. So yeah. I'm not How kind. missing out on that. That's so kind. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. I hope that as you have listened to this conversation today, that you will think of someone that needs to also feel of that hopeful, loving God 
and that you'll share this episode with them. And with John and I, each week we have conversations of, of God, but I hope that today you have felt his, his love for you. And we'll see you again on Talk of Him. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Talk of Him. If you're looking for more opportunities to connect with the Savior through Scripture study, please check out our New Testament study guide called Find Him. It's not overwhelming. We have references, citations, places for you to journal and have your own Talk of Him experiences as you find the Savior in your Scripture study each week. We hope you will visit SeagullBook.com in stores and online now.